Good evening, class, and welcome to our tax matters. Tax class for today. We have uh, a brand new topic which will build up on what we have been doing for some time now. So let me share my notes and let's see what we have in store today. Okay. Fine. So we can all see my notes. Okay. Let me keep this here. See my notes here, and um, let's see if I can see your chat too. Fine, we have everything set up now. Today's class, we shall be taking what we call taxation of settlements, trusts, and estates. Taxation of settlements trusts and estates. This is a very important topic that you might not want to miss because it usually comes up in the exam. Okay? So let me take you into the, to the class rules for today because I see that some of us usually fail on these class rules. The one I want to emphasize is not starting your, your audio or your video. It distracts the teacher, and I wouldn't want us to be distracted during the next two hours. Okay, now let's look at the objective of today's study. You'll be able to understand the meaning and nature of settlements, trusts, and estates, then you are going to appreciate the relevant tax law that guides settlement, trust, and estate. Then you understand the mode of operation, that is the modus operandi for computing tax liabilities relating to settlement, trust, and estates. Now, what is a settlement? A settlement is a means by which enjoyment of an estate is transferred to another person. Either you enjoy the whole estate, it's actually called estate. <laughs> Let me not bite my tongue. It's actually called estate. The enjoyment of an estate from one person to another through a disposition, trust, covenant, agreement, arrangement. Well, all these things here, you'll be seeing a lot of legal terms. So any way, any arrangement, any arrangement whereby somebody's estate is transferred to another person is called a settlement. Now that would mean that if someone dies and his property, that is his estate, is transferred from the deceased to perhaps his surviving relations, that means by which that transfer goes to the beneficiary or to the surviving person is called a settlement. Now it could be in the form of a trust. So you look at what a trust mean. So you also look at what is estate. So now let's look at the estate first. It is the aggregate properties possessed by a person, including his goods, money, and so on, or other types of properties. So if someone say, what is your estate? You won't say until it is real estate. It's no matter of real estate. The person is trying to tell in legal terms that what is your 
aggregate of your property. What are you worth? So you check what is your money in hand, money in bank, your real estate, your investment, everything, all of them. The aggregate of all your properties are your estates. Now, what is a trust? The term trust relates to equitable obligation binding a person called a trustee to deal with a property over which he or she has custody, which is in the trust property for the benefits of persons, beneficiaries of which he or she may be one. So it means that someone will create a trust. That person who is creating this trust is the person who has the estate. It is the person who has the property. He will create a trust and hand that trust over to a trustee. This is different from what we call board of trustees. Now this trustee could be a, a legal person, an appointed person, sometimes called executor. Could be, it may be, it may not also be a legal person, it could be anybody to which this estate has been handed over to deal equitably with this estate by way of settlements to those who are the beneficiaries. This trustee could be a beneficiary, he could also be a non-beneficiary. So we see that a settlement is a means where an estate being given in custody to trust or trustee being given in custody to a trustee in trust so that this trust could be carried out in the terms stated by the executive uh, by the trust by the person creating the, 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 the trust so all of these are legal jargon so you may need to understand them. look at some of that definition a child could include a stepchild. Who is a stepchild? Maybe you, you get married to another person and the person has a child and that is your stepchild. An adopted child, the one you, you are not your biological child too. Stepchild could also not be your biological child. Adopted child is also someone who you adopt an illegitimate child, someone who is not born into wedlock. All of these constitute a child. Who is a settler? A settler in relation to a settlement includes a person by whom the settlement was entered or made into directly, and um, in particular, which includes a person who has provided or undertaken to provide funds for the purpose of the settlement. In other words, the settler is the one who is creating this, the trust, who has the settlement that needs to be transferred to another person for enjoyment. So you see, settlement comes from settler. Okay, will. A will is a document made by a person to show how his assets, which I can say his estate, should be distributed at his death. So the person mentioned in the will to administer the estate is called the executor. So if you are mentioned in the will that please execute my will in the in the in the event of my demise it means you are the executor now when the disease has no executor one will be appointed 
for him. The court will appoint an executor. Then there is what they call an annuitant. What is an annuitant? It comes from the word annuity. What is annuity? Equal amount of money every month or every year, particularly. So an annuitant is someone who is receiving an annuity. So it could be an annual payment from an estate, it could be monthly, but naturally we call it annuity and it is taken as, as yearly payment, annual payment from an estate. So it means an estate could be an investment and that investment is yielding money and is being paid yearly to someone or some people call annuitants. So you will get to see all of that. Now, who is a beneficiary? A beneficiary is someone who receives income from settlement. Now, a, a beneficiary is different from an annuitant because an annuitant receives a specified amount of money yearly, and a beneficiary receives income. So his income is not specified. Any income that comes is going to the beneficiary as stated in the will. The annuitant takes a particular fixed amount. So in other, in other words, a beneficiary and an annuitant could be one and the same person. And also, an annuitant could be different from a beneficiary. All right, legacy. A legacy is a person who receives a gift of personal property by will. And so the legacy could either be a specific legacy. A specific legacy is someone named in the will to receive a particular thing. And so a specific legacy and a beneficiary are the same. So because the beneficiary is named in the will, so he also becomes a specific legatee. A, a residual legatee is a person who receives the residue, the remainder of the property after the specific legatees have been settled. So you see, after all the beneficiaries, the annuitants have been settled, whatever remains goes to the residual legatee. In our lecture today, you are going to find out that the trustee is also the residual legatee. The trustee is the residual legatee. A divisee is a person who receives real property under a will. Now, real property is real estate. Personal representative is a person whether executor or administrator who is charged with the administration of the estate of a deceased person and in whom the estate is vested for the purpose of distribution. So it is this person that is a personal representative of the deceased or the personal representative of the one who created the trust or of the settler. He is a personal representative. He is the executor, the administrator, the one who will see that the will of that deceased person is being discharged to the letter. He is the one who will liquidate all the estates and ensure that payments are made. Who is a life tenant? A life tenant is the person or persons who has a right to the income or property held in trust for life. So if this investment that this trust created is a life investment, the person named has the right to get income from that trust for life. The remainder man is the person who has the right to the capital of the settlement when the life interest terminates. 
all of these are legal jargons which you should know administration period is the period between the death of the deceased and the date in which the executor is able to set up the trust or distribute the residue of the estate so in other words if mr xyz died on 31st june or 31st may 31st may uh, 2019 and between 1st of june 2019 till today's date 19th of june today was the last day that all the residue of the estate was being distributed and nothing is left that period is called the administration period it is a period that the executor was or administrator was administered over the estates of the deceased now who are the chargeable persons here the chargeable persons are people who are pay, liable to pay tax from settlements from the trust from the estates now the beneficiary is chargeable to task because he receives income he receives something he is chargeable to tax on the portion of income that comes to him what about an annuitant an annuitant also is a chargeable person we can say that an annuitant receives annual amount every time it's as if he's working for it but it's not working neither is this a non it could be it could be it could be res, uh, regarded as an unearned income anyway because they didn't end it they are just given as gifts so both the beneficiary and the annuitant whether they are the same person or different people they are chargeable to tax now the trustee or executor is also chargeable to tax why because we said he is a remain um we call it one we call him one name a remainder residual legatee so because he's a residual legatee who receives the residue he is chargeable to tax the beneficiary and annuity they are specific they are chargeable to tax the settler the person who created the trust is also a chargeable person to tax so he's chargeable to tax so these are the three groups of people that are chargeable to tax i believe we are all following now what is the basis period for trust estate and settlement like we know the basis period is the preceding year basis so it is a preceding year basis now a trustee normally prepare accounts from all sources of the settlement trust or estate from the day after the deceased dies to 31st december of each year becomes the first period so if somebody dies 30th december 2019 from 31st december 2019 to that day becomes one day that one day becomes the first period the first year if it happens 31st december he dies from january 1 till december 31st of the next year becomes the first period if he dies in january 1 from january 2 to december 31st becomes the first period then the second period will be from january 1 to december 31st 
Now, because this is an individual, it's an individual. So the person does not have a, an account, uh, an ongoing, uh, is, the person is, is no longer alive. So you cannot say he is a going concern. So by default, we take the fiscal year, take the fiscal year. So the period of trust, the period for accounting starts from the first year, the day after the person dies, the 31st December of that year, or the second period will start from January 1 to the end of December every year. The last year will be from January 1 to the date that the estate, the trust settlement and estate are finally discharged or distributed. So let's say the last part was distributed maybe February 28th. So from January 1 to February 28th will be the last period for consideration. Now note that there is nothing like commencement rule, no cessation rule under this. So we cannot say, okay, the day uh, that the person dies, the next day will start commencement rule. No, we don't do that. And we do not say there is a change of accounting period. No, there is nothing like cessation period, no penultimate, nothing. Once a person dies and his estate is about to be created as a trust, then it starts and follow the way prescribed. So the 31st day of December each year. But note that it is being charged to tax on preceding year basis. So in every question of unit and trust, you would either see year ended, 31st December, or if the question comes that that is the final period of the trust, you will see the date it was finally discharged. Who is the relevant tax authority in this account? Where all the income of the trust for the year of assessment arises from one territory, maybe from one state. Let's say the person who created the trust, the deceased person whose estate is about to be transferred and all that is in Lagos or he dies in Lagos. And perhaps all his income, everything is being derived from Lagos. So Lagos becomes the taxing authority. The tax goes to LIROS, Lagos Internal Revenue. Now what if this man has houses in Abuja, has houses in Lagos, has investment in what's Harcourt and all that, and there are more than one territory, then it has to go to the Federal Inland Revenue Service. So this is not the case of whereby we are talking about um, um, talking about residency like we did the last time. But note that the trustee or the executor, anything they aim, we said that time, will be chargeable to tax on the deemed residents, the, uh, the deemed resident area of the deceased. So if the, the, the executor of the will comes from say, let's say Abuja, but the deceased is deemed to be resident in Lagos, the tax for the, for the trust or for the executor goes to Lagos. Now what is computed income? Computed income. So that is one of the term we are going to be seeing, computed income. The term computed income of an estate or trust or settlement is the difference between the total income and allowable expenses. And so there will be a total income. Remember when you are creating the account for the deceased, you are going to bring all income from all sources. So this total income 
is as good as saying gross income. So sometimes gross income would go for here. So total income from all sources. Now you're not less what we call allowable expenses. So that means there are some expenses that are not allowed. So when we check the allowable expenses and remove it from the total income, what we have is computed income. So what do we do? What is the allowable expense here? The allowable expense includes the expenses of the trustee or executor or the one who is the administrator in connection with the settlement trust or estate which are authorized by the will. So any expense the executor makes that is authorized, that is allowable. Then another one is any fixed annuity that is paid out of income under the will. So fixed annuity is there. And I will also say that all other allowable expenses for businesses are also included here. Where the income of the trust or settlement include any gain or profit from trade, profession or vocation or rent or premium, such additions and expenses thereon shall ordinarily be taken into account in arriving at the computed income. One of such classical examples is business trade. When you have a business income and you have a capital allowance, you have to remove the capital allowance from the business income so that you can derive what you call your computed income. So let's say this man is a businessman, this man has a profession, this man is also an in an association where they pay him. For example, in ICANN, when you get to a particular age, and the person dies, they pay some certain amount of money as uh, life insurance to the beneficiary of the person. So that is another example. Okay. Now, the computed income, like we said, is the difference between the total income and allowable expenses. Okay. Let's look at the capital allowance. The capital allowance, capital allowance of the deceased individual, where an asset of a trade or business or profession or vocation forms part of the estate of the deceased individual, being assets in respect of which an annual allowance may be claimed in arriving at the total income of that individual for the year of assessment in which he died, the capital allowance shall be computed as follows. One, no balancing allowance or charge will be given or made to that individual in respect of asset for that year. Okay? The estate shall be deemed to have incurred qualifying expenditure on acquisition of the assets equal to the amount to the residue of the expenditure on the day following the death of the individual. So what is the tax written down value is what is deemed to be the amount of acquisition. In the event of the disposal of the assets on or after that day, an addition to be made by way of balancing charge is computed in sorry, by way of a balancing charge in the computing of the income of the estate shall be made by reference to the sum of all allowable deductions or allowances made in respect of the assets to the individual and to the estate. No worry, as we get into question, you will understand what we are saying by all of this. Look at losses. Losses are relieved in the normal way by deducting from computed income. So you have to, for you to relieve losses, you have to do what we call computed income. So you, you find out that one thing about 
computed income is like is acting like accessible profit. This computed income is acting like accessible profit. Yes, we have adjusted profit. We have all, your, all our gross profit. You remove all your allowable expenses. What you get normally is supposed to be accessible profit. But now, in terms of this account, you are calling it computed income. So computed income are very, very important. Where the loss was transferred to the estate or trust, it is not an allowable relief and so should be added back. The normal restrictions also apply. What is the normal restriction? You cannot relieve loss above what is actually incurred. All those loss relief things we learned applies here. So you see, we've seen certain things that we learned previously. Loss relief here, we'll talk about um, residency is here, basis period is here, capital allowance is here. What about taxation? Since it is an individual involved, the trustee is an individual, okay? It's also representing the deceased. Everything is under the personal income tax. Now, there are something called discretionary payments. These are fixed amounts payable to direct beneficiary or beneficiaries as authorized by the trust deed. Now, this is different from annuity. Annuity is being authorized that this year, every year, please pay this amount to this named beneficiary. But now, there is what they call discretionary payments. We said before that fixed annuity are allowable expenses deducted before we get our computed income. Now, discretionary payments is different, all right? A trustee or executioner has no power to make discretionary payments to the beneficiaries unless authorized by the instrument appointing him. So if the instrument appointing him says you can make discretionary payments, then he will make those discretionary payments. Where the instrument authorizing the making of discretionary payments, it would generally provide for the apportionment of the net income after, after such payments. So you see, now, the, execu the executioner or the executor has been granted the right to make discretionary payments, right? Fine. So he can now make discretionary payments at his own discretion. These are not allowable expenses. These are appropriation. In fact, it means that the discretionary payment is like an advance of your of the of your of your apportionment. It means that out of what is supposed to be apportioned, they are not paying discretionary payments. So discretionary payments are not to be computed before we get our computed income. So that means we'll get something like total income less allowable expenses equal to computed income. Okay, allowable expenses will include payments to uh, annuity payments, trustee payments, things like that. Then you we'll get your computed income. After computed income, the next thing that comes after computed income is either discretionary payments discretionary payments. After the discretionary payments, what we have is net computed income, otherwise called the distributable profits. It 
is that distributable profit that will not be distributed accordingly. Now look at infants under a settlement. I will skip that because it is still repeated under special provision as to settlements on unmarried children, whereby virtue or by or in consequence of a settlement and during the life of a settler. Who is the settler? The man who created the will, who has the will before he died. So during his lifetime, an income is paid to or for the benefit of the child of that settler in a year of assessment during his lifetime. The income shall, if at the time of payment of of the time of payment, the child was an infant, and not only an infant, and is unmarried. That income will be treated as the income of the settler for that year, and not the income of any other person. Now, income paid to, or for the benefit of a child or of a settler, shall not be treated as provided above for any year of assessment in which the aggregate amount of the income paid for the benefit of the child does not exceed 500 naira. Now suffice it also say too that a trust is created. A trust is created when there are more than one beneficiary. So if there are more than one beneficiary, someone will become a trust. That's one reason why a trust is also created. So the executor may not be the one in trust. Either he's the one in trust or he may, he may be appointed trustee. So whenever there is more than one beneficiary, so for the equitable distribution of the assets, there must be a trust. Second reason for providing a trust is when the beneficiary, whenever a beneficiary, or even if it is the only one beneficiary and the person is a child, then there should be a trust. All right, for let's say the above shall not apply in relation to an income under a settlement in a year preceding a year of assessment if the settler is not in Nigeria at any time during that year of assessment or is not in Nigeria for a period or periods amounting to 183 days or more in any 12 months period, commencing in the calendar year and ending either the same year or the following year. So these are all that. Let's go straight to accounts of the estate. Now look at the account of the estate. The account of the estate are to be prepared to what year, to what date, 31st December each year. And to the date of the final distribution of the estate. I said that before, every account is prepared to December 31st. The last account should be prepared to the date of the final distribution of the estate. The responsibility of preparing the account rests with either the trustee, whenever there are more than one people, beneficiary, the trustee is in charge of preparing the account. The executor could also be the trustee. So that's it. Now the accessible income and tax. The income of an individual or of a trustee or execution, executor from a settlement trust or estate of deceased person made, created, or administered in Nigeria is ascertained in accordance with the provision of the second schedule of personal income tax act. So it is a personal income tax act. So if there is going to be tax, it's going to be on that graduated rate. All right, the accessible income of a trustee of an execution, executor of the estate of a deceased for any year of assessment shall be the income of that person as determined under the following paragraphs and on preceding year basis. So you see that one, 
the income of a settlement or trust shall be deemed to be the income of the settler or the person creating the trust as the case may be. So the income of the settler is the income of the trust. So the trust is a representative, it's a personal representative of the settler. So the income of the settler is deemed to be the income of the trust. As the case may be, if the, that settler or person retains or acquire an immediately exercisable general power of appointment over the capital assets of the settlement or trust or over the income derived therefrom. That settler or person makes use directly or indirectly by borrowing or otherwise of any part of the income arising under the settlement or trust. So all these are legal jargons, which you should also know. So you see that the trustee is representing the settler and the the interest the the, the 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 monies in the hands or the income in the hands of the trustee is as good as the income in the hand of the settler and so the settler is liable to tax through the trustee we said before who are the chargeable persons we said the annuitant and the beneficiary it could be one and the same person they are chargeable to tax. Second, we said the trustee is chargeable to tax. And now we can see that the settler is also chargeable to tax. But since the settler is no longer alive, the trustee is a personal representative. In fact, the way the trustee will be chargeable to tax is because he has the remainder of the profits from the settler. Okay, we are going to see all of this. I'm going to see all of this when we get questions. Okay, payment of tax. The income arising from a settlement, trust, or estate is accessible in the hands of the individual beneficiary. It means that whenever the executor pays money to the beneficiary, the beneficiary has earned income. So any income it received from the trust is chargeable in these hands. The relevant tax authority is the tax authority of the state where the beneficiary is resident on the 1st of January of that year. So now let's look at it this way. The estate is having, let's say there are more than one income, sources of income for that estate. We said if there are one income coming from just, if there's income coming from only one place, let's say in Lagos, the settler was having all his income in Lagos. Now the trustee came from Abuja. The income of the trust of the settler, which is chargeable to tax, will be for Lagos. Lagos State where we take the tax. We also said that assuming his income comes from different places, more than one place. So it's going to the, that of the settler, which the trustee is representing we go to federal government, FIRS, as long as it's coming from different states. I want you to get that point. Now, as the trustees administering the estate, the, the, the will, beneficiaries will be getting their cuts, their share. The income in the hands of the beneficiary depends on where they are resident as at 1st January of that year. So if they are resident in Lagos, so be it, Lagos will tax them. If the resident goes to maybe on those states and is found there as that is where he lives from the 1st of January of that year, that is where his tax will go. So where the settler is having his own one place, 
where he is deemed to be resident before he died, just before he died, the beneficiaries will have their own wherever they are resident or deemed to be resident. So you see why we have to learn this residence rule. I want you to go back to that residence rule and actually look at that principle so that you will understand because it may come up in exam. In fact, let me tell you, your exam could be so tricky in the sense that they might mix residency and this topic together. All right. Now we said wherever the, the, the beneficiary is resident on 1st of January. Know that where the instrument does not provide for apportionment of net income or there is a balance of adjusted income not apportioned. So that part that is not apportioned, such income is taxable in the hands of the trustee or execution, executor for the estate. Let me explain. Let's say the, the, the man has uh, five children, or let's say he has yeah, four children, and he has one million. And he now said 20% of one million, okay, 20% of the distributable income should go to each of his child. And let's say the distributable income is one million. 20% is how much? 200,000. So we see 200,000 go to child A, 200,000 goes to child B, 200,000 goes to child C, 200,000 goes to child D, four of them receiving 200,000. How much is that? 800,000. Who receives the remaining 200? That is the undistributed income. It is now in the hands of the trustee. So that part is chargeable to tax in the hands of the trustee. So that is also going to be taxed where the settler is deemed to be resident before he died. It is becoming interesting now. We'll have to take three examples to illustrate. So Please, can you give me a moment? Then just give me a few minutes. Some few seconds. Let me I'm coming. Okay, so um, welcome back. Let's uh, 
look at some illustrative example here. Um, the questions for uh, trusts and uh, the questions for this topic are usually very, very similar. Very, very similar. So once you master one, how one is being done, you can master everything. It's just that somehow they might change certain things in the way they form the question, but the basic principle is the same. Now, Mr. Aqua created a trust for his four children. So that means Mr. Aqua is the settler. So he is the one who created the trust. All right. So um, for his four children, Ade, Barua, Chidi, and Dafo. The records of the trustee, so now he is dead. So there is a trustee who is administering for him. For the year ended, almost always know that it's going to be 31st December. So you see 31st December 2010 shows you that this will be treated in 2011 year of assessment. Review the following information. Now look at trading from profit from trading. These are sources of income. Interest received on fixed deposits. It is assumed that this is what you are getting, right? Now rent from property. You see the roads gross. Even if they didn't write gross, assume gross. If it was dividend that was recorded here, what did I say you should assume? Assume net and convert to gross. Other income. Other income is this. So when you add all of these together, you are going to get is gross income. Other relevant information include, we have a fixed annuity here. So look at his children. He created a trust for these children. So that means these children are beneficiaries. So there are four beneficiaries. And one of them here is getting a fixed annuity. So he's getting a fixed annuity. We said this fixed annuity is an allowable expense. We also said the remuneration of the trustee is fixed at this amount. So the remuneration is also allowable. Then there is a variable plus 2.5% of the computed income. Then we also have the allowable expenses of the trustee. So apart from his salary, which is his fee, there are other allowable expenses amounted to 25,000, okay? All these are to be deducted from the gross income, or uh, yeah, total income to, to, to arrive at your computed income. So, but you are going to still find 2.5 of this computed income and deduct it from the total income to get this computed income. Wow, just a moment. Wow, is it dark? Okay. All right. Now, the trustee made the following discretionary payments. Now this discretionary payment, what did I say about discretionary payments? That they are not deducted from the total profit or total income before arriving at the computed income. These are deducted after the computed income to get your net income or distributable profits. Now this 22,000, which is a capital allowance, 
will be deducted from the trading activities because it's a trading activity that will give rise to the capital allowance. So when you say 980 minus 220, that is what will give you your net profit from trade. Then you add to others to get your, your gross profit. Now, half of the net distributable income of the settlement is to be shared equally among the beneficiaries. Now, what it means is this. If there are 1 million Naira that is deemed to be the distributable income, half of it, which is 500,000 Naira, will be the one that will be shared to all the four children. The remaining half will be income in the hands of the trustee. So that is just it. We are going to see how we are going to solve it. They said, you are required to calculate the income of the settlement chargeable to tax in the hands of the beneficiaries. That is in the hands of Barua, Adechi, the under four. The in amount of undistributed income of the settlement assessment accessible to tax in the hands of the trustee. That remaining half is what they are asking us about. So now let's see how we can solve this problem. It's page 10. Let's see how we can solve this problem. All right. So solution. Do you see the way I solved it here now? I want you to look at it that way. Now, we are going to calculate. Now, we are looking at Ade, Barua, Chidi, and Dafor because we are looking at the income in their hands. That's why we put it here. I could as well say uh, Mr. Aqua's Trust. Now, this total here represents the, the, the settlement, represents the settlement. It also represents the trustee. This total represents the settlement, also represents the trustee, because it's the trustee that is acting in harmony with the trust to make a settlement to these people. This is similar to, to what we do in partnership accounts. So it's as if these people are in partnership, but they're not in partnership. This is a trust account. So this totally represents the trustee. So now trading from profit, uh, this, uh, profit from trading activities, we realize it is 980, as we can see here. Then we said we're going to remove our capital allowance of 220 here. We're going to remove it. So we remove it. It becomes nine. Wow, that's a mistake here. That's a mistake here due to calculation. Sorry. So let's see what that figure is. Sorry for for that wrong figure. Nine eighty thousand minus twenty two thousand gives you nine fifty eight. You see, this is transposition error. 928, nine, sorry, 958. So go there and put 958 instead of 985. <laughs> now we have um, interest on fixed deposits. Interest on fixed deposits. We say it's 270. We brought it here. Then we also said. Um, rent from property gross 620 you see there other income other income 163000 you can see it down here so when we add all of these so let's say 958000 plus 270000 plus 620000 plus 163,000. We are getting 2,011,000. So this figure here is correct. 
it is just this figure that has transposition error. This five would have been here where the eight is, and this eight would have been here where the five is. So you correct it in your book. Sorry for that. Okay. Then we said after we get our gross income, which we also call total income, what do we do? We deduct allowable expenses. And what are the allowable expenses? First one is the fixed annuity, 35,000 Naira. So what we do here, we say fixed annuity, we are deducting 35,000. Now, as we are deducting this money, it is going from the trustee and entering into the hand of the four. So you see it is having minus here, it is having a positive sign here. So it is going away from here and entering here. The next thing again we ask again is um, the remuneration of the trustee is fixed at 20,000. So we come here, remuneration. Okay, before we go to remuneration here, we have this allowance here. Okay, 25,000. Okay, now, after putting the allowance of 25,000, we'll go to remuneration. Look at remuneration. This 20,000 is fixed. We put it down here. Now, the second part of the remuneration, they said plus 2.5% of the computed income. So now this is 2.5 of the computed income. We don't know what is computed income, but this figure should also be deducted before we get computed figure. So what do we do? It means that this is our gross income. We will now less this 35,000. When we less this 25,000, and when we less this 20,000, whatever we get, because we have not removed this 2.5% of computed income, it means that our computed income is 2.5 percent more than it is it means it is 2.5 percent more than it is okay for those of you who when we are doing when you are learning what they call gross profit margin it is the same principle it is the same principle if you have a gross profit margin of 20 percent all you will not say is your 20% all over 120. So 20 all over 120, the sales, because the sales also has the profit in it. It's also the same principle when you are doing VAT inclusive. VAT inclusive. So you put your 5% all over your 105. All now that that is 7.5%, you say 7.5% all over 107.5. Now, because you are not, you have not gotten your computed income, you are going to say 2.5%, or that is 2.5 divided by 102.5, because that computed income is 2.5% more than it is now. It is that 2.5% we want to remove so that everything will become 100% of computed income. So now let's look at what we're going to do now. We we'll say 2.5 over 102.5 multiplied by this, your gross income. This was your fixed annuity, less of fixed annuity. This was your allowable expense. Look at the fixed salary. When we do it in our calculator here, we will say this minus 35,000 minus 25,000 minus 20,000. What we are getting is 1,913,000. Then we will now look for 2.5 divided by 102.5. What we are getting is 47,098 Naira. So you see 47,098 Naira is your variable 
uh, remuneration of the trustee. So now you can now remove this figure from as part of your liable expenses. So when you remove everything here, your computed income will give you this. So now let's do a little check. If we do 2.5% of this figure, we are going to get this figure. So let's see. 2.5 divided by 100, now not 105, 100 times a 1883902, 47,098 naira. So you see, this figure is 2.5% of this. But before we got this figure, whatever we deducted to arrive before this figure, that figure includes this amount. This amount alone is 2.5% of this 100% figure. So now, because before we deducted this, this figure was included in a particular amount, that particular amount is 102.5%. So we are looking for 2.5% of 102.5% to get this figure. So that is how you are supposed to do. Whenever they tell you that something is a, a fraction or a percentage of computed income, and that thing you are looking for is supposed to be deducted before getting the computed income, use this formula. Now, we have gotten our computed income here. Now, the next thing we said was discretionary payment should not be included in computing computed income. So we didn't include it. It is going to be done after computed income. So we have discretionary payment here at day 40, Barua 30, GD 20, and therefore 15. And you can see them here. Now, when you add them together, it is 105. It means as, as we are removing 105 from here, the trustee is paying this discretionary payment. And so they are again going into the hands of the beneficiary. So you see, after the discretionary payment, everything ends. So this computed income minus your discretionary payment, this is distributable income. So this is the income that is supposed now to be distributed to the hands of the trust, of the beneficiaries. Now, what is the condition for distribution? It says half of the net distributable income is to be shared how much? Equally among the beneficiaries. So let's look at half of it. So you see half of this figure. So it's half of this distributable income. So half of it, you're now divided by four. So let's see what half of it is. Half of this figure here, half of this figure is this. Right? So this is this figure that you are dividing now by four to get this so it is this figure that is going to be shared that is going to be given one so this figure we got here is what each person is going to take because we are sharing we are bringing this one into two that is half which is this and then we're not sharing this half equally so you see half of this divided by four so they are getting this 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 and so you add this four together you have to get this so what happens when you, the account ends here when you have shared the whole income. So what will happen now? The A part of the question says, calculate the income of settlement chargeable to tax in the hand of the beneficiaries. So what you will now do is you bring back all the beneficiaries, how much they have taken so far. This one has taken 40 plus this amount this is what is taxable in his hands. This man has taken 30 plus this amount. This is what is taxable in his hands. This one has taken 20 plus this amount. This is what is taxable in his hand. 
this one took three things. It took income, it took discretionary payment, and he took fixed annuity. So these three, add them together, you get this. They are taxable in his hands. So if you want to charge them to tax, all you need to do, you start looking for the first 300, the next 300, the next 300, as the case may be. So the B part says the amount of undistributable income in the hands of the trustee. I said before, this total represents the trustee. So instead of writing total, you can also write trustee. So you see, out of this amount that is supposed to be distributed, we've taken half. When we take half, the remaining half is what is undistributed. This is what is left in the hands of the trustee. So this amount left in the hands of the trustee is also going to be charged to tax. So you see, it's easy. This, the formula, the principle is the same. The three questions I'm going to solve to you for you today are going to follow the same pattern. The first pattern is get the total income, then remove your allowable expenses. Allowable expenses will include the trustees' fees, the trustees' expenses. It will also include fixed annuity. Get that in your mind. When you get your computed income, then you can make discretionary payment. That's the only thing that comes after, after computed income, discretionary payments, if any. After that, you distribute the profit as stated in the will. Then if there is any undistributed profit, that is what will be in the hands of the trustee. Let's see another question. The second question to illustrate our, our point. Look at allergy is tiag is ti is tig is sorry let me not bite my tongue Ahmad created a trust for his children so this man is the settler he created the trust for his children now look at his children Zainab Abbas and Halima so what am I going to do I'm going to get four columns one for halima one for abbas one for zainab and one for the trustee before he died in 2018 now you know he died in 2018 they would have done 2018 um, account for the estate and settlement 2019 2020 down now we are now because now the execution period, the period of administration is still on and they are making income. Now, this is where we are. As at December 31st, 2012, the, the administration period is still on. Look at the following information that was extracted from the record of the trustee. Remember, the trustee is the one preparing the account. Now, adjusted trading profit for the year so these adjusted profits they don't want you to stress yourself to do all of that they give you adjusted profits now look at the gross income now for you to know that this is 2012 it means it is 2013 tax year so look at small small things you've just been noting your uh, with pencil in your question paper or in fact in a blank place in your answer sheet look at your gross income this figure look at your profits on the sale of assets so they sell some of the assets they get this other miscellaneous income those miscellaneous income could be anything we don't know donation to the social club of the deceased this is not an income now donation is an expenses now donation is it allowable or not allowable. We'll find out. we we'll look at the fixed annuity. Of course, it's going to be an allowable. Fixed remuneration is allowable. Trustees remuneration 
we say 2% of the computed income, of the total computed income, that is total income. Sorry, it's supposed to be total income here, not total computed income. Okay, now other expenses is 4.4 million. Now the trustee provides discretionary payment. So you see, the questions all follow the same pattern. They will give you your profits figure at the top, then you start seeing expenses. You have to determine which one is allowable and which are not. Then don't forget they will give you capital allowance. If they give you that figure, you know it relates to trading profits. Now you will be seeing discretionary payments. You know that's what you will do after your computed profits, your computed income. Now look, you will now look at what is the basis for share. They now said something: three million of other expenses are not taxable. So that means other expenses. 3 million out of it is not taxable. So we have to deduct it so that you do not charge it. 3 million are not taxable. So which one is going to be taxed? The balance is taxable. Are not, sorry, are not tax deductible. Sorry, are not tax deductible. When they say something is not tax deductible, it means it is taxable. All these expenses are supposed to be tax deductible because they are allowable. But they said no, three million out of it is not tax deductible. That means these are not allowable expenses. So that means we have to remove this three million and take the net as allowable. Now they say it is stipulated in the trust that the beneficiaries are to share half of the distributable income equally, just like we did before. They said share half. And how many people are there? There are three people sharing half. Required, the same requirement. Net, now look at it, they said compute the net computed income, which is like the accessible profits and the amount each benef beneficiary will include in his or her tax returns in the relevant year of assessment. You know the relevant year of assessment is 2013. So let's see how we can solve that. So you see again, once again, we have uh, the name of this man now is here. In the first example, I decided to put the children's name, but now I am putting this man's name because one, the requirement is the net computed income. So the net computed income can only come when we are doing the trusts. Then secondly, I could as well do the second one by separating this account. By separating this account, by not doing this like this, by only doing this first, then coming under and doing this other one. But that one may take time. It may also, yeah, it may take time. So why not do it straight? So this is my recommendation. Do it like this. Trading profit, we said it was how much? 24 million. Then we bring our capital allowance of 2.4 million to net it off, becomes 21,600. All other profits, we have rental income, we have sale of assets and miscellaneous that we are all taking care of here. Then we said donation is not an income, it's an expense. So let's see how we treated it. Other expenses, it's supposed to be 4.4 normally, but we said 3 million is supposed to be taxable. That means 1.4 million is what is approved as allowable. That's why we are putting 1.4 million here. Now, this is the gross or total computed income. So the gross income is also called the total computed income. The normal computed income is, is this one here. So this gross income is same thing as total income. And since we are 
computed it is the same thing as total computed income. But what we call computed income is when we have reduced all our allowable expenses. So what is our allowable expenses? Now, these expenses is different from this expense. This is because, look at capital allowance, is reducing the adjusted profits. Other expenses here, whichever way, all of them are the same thing because we are still going to arrive at the same answer at our computed profit. So we look at this as our gross profit. Now look at less allowable expenses. Look at the remuneration. There's a fixed amount here, 800,000, which is done, fine. Now the variable, if I said before, change this one to the total income, 2% of it. So if it is two, sorry, supposed to be even be five percent not even two supposed to be five percent sorry i was hurrying so change it to five percent of gross income so five over hundred multiplied by this will give us this this is different if they said five percent of this computed income so all you would have done is to say this figure minus this, then minus this fixed annuity. Anything you get, anything you get, you find five over 105. That is what would have given you this figure. But now we have said 5% of this. So it can come in two ways. Now, when we look at our fixed annuity, we were told that one person received fixed annuity, 1.2 million Zainab. So Zenap received two, 1.2 million. As it's going off here, it's entering into Zenap. So this minus all of this gives us our computed income. That's fine. Then our discretionary expenses are all of these ones here. So what do we do? We less them. When we add them together, it gives me this and you push them all here. So what is our net computed income? This is what they are even asking us to find. The net computed income. So you see, even this, even though this one is called computed income, and here they said total computed income. This net computed income here is different from computed income. Computed income is the total income minus your allowable expenses is computed income. When you now use the word net, it means that is your distributable income. That means after you have removed your discretionary payment, it, the thing becomes net computed income, otherwise also known as distributable income. Now, let's distribute the income. Then now look at how we distribute the income. The question says half of the distributable income is to be shared equally. So what do we do? We look for 50% of this figure here. When we get it, distribute it equally, divided by three. So these are the things you get when you distribute this figure, which is half of it, which is half of this. You distribute it into three equal parts. That is what you get. So now, this is the undistributed income in the hands of the trustee. So if they say half, that means this one and this one should give us this. That's why this is half. Now, what is the income in the hands of the beneficiaries? You add this plus this plus this, and you're getting this. This plus this, you get this. And this final one, this and this, We'll give you the final figure. Now that's example number two. Let's get to example number three and we'll show you that all the questions are similar. And this is one question that you can score. If it is 20 marks or 25 marks, you're going to get all of them. 
Baba Ali Musa is a trustee. So you see that I will say Baba Ali Musa's trust. Now, the trustee, okay, sorry. Sorry. Baba Ali Musa is a trustee. So he is not the one who created the trust. So don't get it confused like I almost did. Always look for who created the trust. This Baba Ali Musa is the man who is in trust. Look at the man. Let's blah, 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 blah. Junet Diko is the man who created the trust. So you may be tempted to go and put this. So you see why I set this three questions. So you don't go and put this or you put this. How do you know? This man would have been late, would have been deceased. This one is alive. So, and secondly, they said it is for this man's children and not this. So don't go and make the mistake of go and put Baba Ali Musa who started the dog, they will start, uh, you lose the mark for that. Now, they say in favor of his four children, grandchildren and others. He submitted the following information to the Zamfara State Board of Internal Revenue. That means, what does that tell you? It means that late Malam Jr. is deemed to be resident in Zamfara State. Somebody said, in question number one, they said half of the distributable income then you use one over two. One over two is half. One divided by two is half. And they said in question two, they said use half. And I said 50% is also half. When I said, give me 50%, I'm telling you divide it into two is 50% is half. 50% simply means 50 divided by 100 is one over two. It's one over two. 50% is half. One over two is half. When we say one over four is 25%. So if you see me use 25% in place of one over four, it's the same thing. That's simple mathematics. Thank you for bringing up that point, Favor. All right. Now, look at the interest. Now, this Zamfara State Board of Internal Revenue. That is where the trustee is making his tax assessment. So that is where it is deemed that Malam, late Malam Jr. was resident. That's fine. All right, look at what they brought for the fiscal year 2013. That means this must be 2014 year of assessment account. Look at the interest received, look at the dividend received, gross. Residual rental income, this business profit, this miscellaneous income, this trustees remuneration. Look at this fixed, and they said variable is two percent of gross income. Maybe it's because of this two percent that I went to go and write two percent the other time when I meant five. <laughs> now, fixed annuity to grandchildren. Now, Look at his grandchildren, Aminat and Dan Ladi. Administrative expenses is this. Now, if you look at this thing now, the trustee made discretionary payments in line with the trust deeds to the beneficiaries as stated below. So you can see that who are chargeable to tax? Who are chargeable to tax? I told you three set of people. Beneficiary, annuity, annuitants, and the trustee. So the annuitants, Amadi and Danladi, are chargeable to tax. But look at the beneficiaries here. If any of them are inside here, fine. But we have Wakilu, not part of those given annuity, Aisha. Not part, Iliasu and Badamasi. So you see now that this one we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. So you're going to create seven columns. 
each beneficiary. Now look at one. Each beneficiary is entitled to one sixth. So who are the beneficiaries? This is a beneficiary, and these two are also beneficiaries. Capital allowance agreed is this. So they said one sixth share of two third of distributable income. For those who don't understand maths, this thing will just throw you off. How do we solve this? Okay, what are the requirements? They say we should get the net income, net income accessible in the hands of the trustees. So this is net income accessible in the hands of the trustee. What does it mean? It means that undistributable income, that undistributed income in the trustees' hand is what they are asking you. Then they said accessible income in the hands of the beneficiary, all those income that you add to the beneficiary's hands. This is what that, I tell you that they are all the same, similar things. Let's look at how the solution would be like. Okay, so can you see now that the beneficiaries now are now six? Somebody is on in this video. Sorry, Mr. Kende. I'll have to off your video, it's distracting me. Okay, let's learn to just follow the class along. Now, there are six beneficiaries. One, two, three, four, five, six. So how do you know who is a beneficiary? Look, a named annuitant is a beneficiary. Then the other one, they just say the main beneficiary. So these are the two people, two sets of people. And I told you an annuitant, would also be a, a main beneficiary. So there are six here. Now we said the first one is interest received. How much is that interest received here? We got it to be two million. Bring it as stated in the equation. Dividend received gross, eight million. If it was net, you convert it to gross. Rental income, six million. That's here. Business profit. 18 million. Is there any capital allowance? Yes, there was. The question told us there was capital allowance of how much? Um, 4 million 200. So we discharged it from the business profit. Then the miscellaneous income was how much there? Miscellaneous income was 3 million 200. Now, when you add them together, your gross profit is going to be this. This is important because they told us that variable remuneration will be two percent of gross profit so we've gotten our gross profit look at our our allowable expenses our allowable expenses we said the fixed remuneration of the trustee is how much here fixed remuneration 450 yes 450 that's this figure here we take it down here 450 then variable we are told is 2% of gross profit. So all you do is 2% of this gross profit will give you this figure. And not, not only that, we are now told that we have fixed annuity to grandchildren. So you see, grandchildren are also annuity. And you see, they also said here that he created a trust in favor of children, for children and two grandchildren. They didn't mention two grandchildren here, but they say grandchildren, so it would be two and above. So you see those two grandchildren, they gave them annuity. So the total of the annuity is 80,000. So that is what you see here, 80,000, which was given to the two grandchildren named above. Then when we finish that, the next thing we see, we see again was that um, admin expenses of 2,600,000. Admin expenses, 
So what you now do, you say this gross income, less all of these will have computed income of 29,210. This is our computed income, similar to what we call our accessible profits. Now, the next thing we do is discretionary payment. Our discretionary payment, so just follow this, the, 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 the format as it is. Just follow that format. Look at your discretionary payment, are all of these. So you take them, see here, discretionary payments went to the four children in the sum of this. All right. If you add them together, you have 780. So you remove 780 from this figure, you have 28,430. Now, income distributed. The question says here, one sixth share of two third of the distributable income. So what you do, you have to get two third of this income and share it by six. So how did I do it? This is your distributable income. Look for two third of it. That's this. Then share it by six. Anything you get, that is what we placed here. When you add them together to give you this, or if you don't want to add them together to give you this, by the time you say two third of this, by the time you say two third of this figure, anything you get, put your answer here first and put it in brackets. Then go and look for one over six of this figure. That is what they are sharing. So you say first, you do the two third of this. Any answer you get, you put here. Then divide by six, you put it in all the six and eight um, beneficiaries. So the next thing you do, so this remaining one, of course, is going to be one quarter, I mean one third of this because two third has gone into sharing. This one third will be the remainder, which is the same thing as saying, this figure minus this figure will become income in the hands of the trustee. Then income in the hands of the beneficiary, which we are told to look for, is simply this and this together. Give you this. 200 plus this gives you 3,358,889. This plus this gives this. This plus this. Now, this one, you add three figures. You add three figures. Two figures here. I mean, these two figures to give you this. So that is the income in the hands of the beneficiary. So you look at the net in, compute the net income accessible in the hands of the trustee. This is the net income in the hands of the trustee. And they said, accessible income in the hand of each beneficiary. This is the accessible income in the hands of each beneficiary. So this computed income is like the accessible income in the hands of the trustee. It's like accessible income. But now, in, the, in terms of beneficiary, this final one is their accessible profit. This one, we don't call it accessible profit, too. We call it computed income. We don't call it accessible profit. So we call the final one the income in the hands of the trustee. So the trustee does not have anything called accessible profit. But I'm just using the word accessible profit so that because we learn by association, this is what is kind of replacing that accessible profit. That is the kind of thing I'm trying to get across to you. What have we learned so far? Well, we have, okay, we have assignments. Assignment here is trust number four. So I want you to look at this man. He retired as chief accountant in here, 2007. Now he is survived, that means he died. He appointed Mr. Hassan as the executor. So it is not Mr. Hazan's account, it's Mr. Coco James. It's going to be 2011 year of assessment, if you know that. 
then look at all these check which one is income if there is a then check which of these are accessible profits and um, accessible and um, allowable expenses check them here then check if there is any annuitant then check if there is any discretionary payment then distribute the profit according to how profit should be shared i want you to do that as an assignment and submit to me before the next task class so this is your assignment you are calculate the amounts to be disclosed by the beneficiaries in their income tax for 2011 assessment here so i don't even need the for the beneficiary and um, for the uh, trustee of course you still show it but i want to know how much will be disclosed by the beneficiaries in their income tax returns what is the income amount to be disclosed what have we learned so far this topic has helped us to understand the meaning and nature of settlement trust and estates we have also appreciated the relevant laws guiding settlement trust and estates and we have seen the mode of operation for computing tax liabilities relating to trust and estates so that's the topic for today by next week we are going to go into a new topic it might be a calculating topic it can also be a non-calculating topic okay so looking at it now this is the um fifth or sixth week um okay this is likely the the fifth or sixth week right so we are almost covering all parts of the syllabus. So we hope to cover it in time so that we'll have time to, to read them up, discuss them, and practice them. Any question you have, feel free to tell me in the um, WhatsApp forum. All right. So do have a nice day. You don't have any other question except the one I've just answered. So let's take advantage of the WhatsApp forum to ask questions. Thank you so much for being part of this class. I wish you a good night's sleep as you review everything we've learned over the beginning of the lecture still now. And I want you to ask questions because I want you to pass. Thank you all attending. See you again next week. Good night.